And we're live. Let me oh, get a get link. Sort of link to uh, share on Twitter saying that we're all live. Yep, I'm going to find it right now. All right. So, everyone, want to start introducing yourselves? <clears throat> Go ahead, guys. <laughs> Sure. Hi, I'm Brian Hill. Um, I I write things. Uh, Detective Comics was one of them. I've got other stuff, you know, out there. Cyber Force, Aphrodite Five, uh, X Men stuff is happening, and I'm happy to be here. You know, out there. Yeah. I'm Richard Pace. I'm drawing second cover for Vertigo. Uh, the last thing I did for Vertigo was a series of covers for Imaginary Fiends. I took a long time away from comics, and this is my really coming back. Uh, I'm B. Claymore, <clears throat> um, writer. Um, I've written stuff for lots of different people. Um, and um, well, I had something else I was going to say, but uh, oh, oh, you're Vertigo. Yeah, uh, I've been rejected by Vertigo many times, so um, over many different. Uh, um, editorial uh, reigns for many different reasons. So, <laughs> if that's that's the one, that's the one imprint that I'd, I've never. Yeah, I had to think. I don't think I've ever actually gotten anything to print in. But um, I've had some interesting experiences with Vertigo over the years. I'll tell you that much. That's really surprising, fan. Clay, because because your work is so character driven. You know, it just feels like that's a natural fit. But um, I'm well, nowhere. That's why I've been asked making in comics. That's why I've been asked to pitch by many Vertigo editors, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly how the higher. I mean, I I, I do kind of know how the hierarchy is there now, but um, over the years, it's kind of shifted as to who has the immediate like final say over what gets done and the reasons that they have. You know, when Karen Berger was there, she had very specific, actually not really very specific, but she had her reasons, and then Dan and Jim kind of stepped in, and so anyway, it's 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 always been like you've got to climb this ladder, and then at a certain point for reasons that might have nothing to do with the actual, you know, pitch. Um, it gets shunted aside. So most recently, I get, I've, I've talked to Jamie about it, Jamie Rich about a couple of things over the past few years since I've known him for years. And, and uh, we got, we got somewhere, but not all the way. So it's fine. That's a little similar to what I had when I first broken back in the battle days of the nineties, I really wanted to work for vertigo. Those were, that was the, uh, the one spot that was doing books I wanted to draw. But I was classically trained, and uh, I knew how to uh, assemble figures in a more realistic way. Um, so my samples had kind of more of a naturalistic drawing approach. So I showed my stuff to Vertigo, and they go, this stuff is too too polished, too pretty. You should be doing superheroes. I'd be like, but I want to do Vertigo. But because I also wanted to pay my rent, I'd go across the street to Marvel, and they'd go, wow, you should be drawing Vertigo stuff. <laughs> I said, yeah, they sent me here, and I went, all right, we'll give you superheroes. <laughs> You know, not to digress too much, but if we're talking about Vertigo, I uh, when I was first working for DC, geez, like 10 years ago now, um, I was being in Kansas City and being close to Jason Aaron and, and Tony Moore and these guys. I, I remember talking to my editor, because Vertigo was kind of, 10 years ago, Vertigo was kind of, I mean, if you remember, it sort of lost its way for a while there, you know, and, and uh uh, wasn't dialing up the hits and everything. And uh, I begged my editor to uh, Sorry, I, actually, actually, so Jason Aaron had gone to Vertigo to do Scalp and I begged my editor, I was like, you've got to get Jason Aaron and, and Tony Moore who's doing Exterminators into the DC universe proper. And I was told mm -hmm. at the time that DC didn't hire Vertigo writers or artists. Um, so the best way for those, they said the best way for guys like Jason and Tony to get work at DC was to use their Vertigo work to get work at Marvel. And then they offer them work at DC. It was, oh, man. It, was it was the craziest. I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around it. So, uh, so of course, what happened then is Jason went over to Marvel and became, you know, arguably their biggest gun over the years. And lo and behold, um, they started grabbing Vertigo writers and bringing them into the DC universe. But uh, that, anyway, that's kind of where Vertigo was at one point. It was just they referred to them as like the guys upstairs. And, and uh, I had an editor I was dealing with, we were trying to pitch a detective thing. And he was like, I've talked to Vertigo about, you know, possibly being able to pitch it to them. And they were just, they may still be, but they were so disconnected at the time. It was crazy. Mm. Uh, 
anyway. So well, I, I just got told now that, uh, strangely enough, my work is too weird for DC Universe work. Dude, I yeah, I, I don't even get me started on the criteria for work for drawing for DC. I I, I I'm baffled all the time. I, so many guys I have tried to bring to the attention of DC editorial that won't get anywhere. Well, Nelson's a good example, Brian. Um, I, quite a mm. while ago, I kind of was pushing Nelson's stuff on on a talent coordinator there, and uh, it seems like these guys would always end up popping up at Marvel or something and, you know, drawing some attention. Um, and then maybe DC would, would, would consider them, but I've never been able to, I mean, I think I have a pretty good eye for who can do what, especially when it comes to storytelling and, you know, um, but man, I've banged my head against the, the wall a lot trying to get a DC editorial to look at certain guys. So I don't know. Doesn't make sense to me, but vertigo has actually evolved into kind of, I mean, you know, you're look at a guy like Nick Darrington, who, yeah, um, who's great and seems to have kind of finally found himself in terms of being able to, you know, produce material. Um, you know, he did a flying dick issue years and years ago, and I've known him for shit 15 years. But it's oh, nice my. to see a guy like Nick, who, again, I could five, six, seven years ago, if you told me he was doing anything in DC, I would have been shocked. But um, it's nice to see the door open through Vertigo for guys like that. Yeah. It really, it really seems that uh, Vertigo is making a uh, serious shot at it again. I, I think, I think um, everyone would kind of agree there was a period there within that last twenty years where Image kind of ate their ate their lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think to a degree they still are, but at least in, what, the, the nice thing to see and from my perspective with Vertigo is that they've got a perspective now, you know, they've sort of got, um, they've got a direction, you know, um, um, you can at least kind of tell what they're trying to do. Everything kind of makes sense when, when put together. And it's been a long time for that. Cause, um, but it's good to see. I mean, I assume Brian and I know, I mean, I'm assuming, assuming you guys, were, you know, some of my earliest, primary influences were that initial wave of vertigo books, you know, Hellblazer and Preacher and uh, Sandman to an extent, but uh, sure, sure. Um, so that's always been my thing is I've always thought vertigo was lacking. I thought vertigo built itself on really strong protagonists that were kind of character driven and, and, and um, you know, just these iconic characters, whether it's Swamp Thing or Hellblazer or uh, Preacher. And I, that's the thing that I think they kind of lost sight of over the years. And so invariably when I was pitching stuff, I was always trying to kind of lean into that, whether or not it was necessarily what they were trying to do themselves. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I get We were talking about Vertigo, so we should really talk about its identity and its history. Um, identity, that's the key. It really, I mean, for the longest time, I think Vertigo was defined by the adult take on superheroes uh in the 90s with with room to grow out into various genres i th i think one of the cornerstones of why vertigo kind of creatively collapsed is it lost that uh, a, a reason to maintain that main thread through yeah. the thousands i mean swamp thing went away hellraiser um might have been overexposed uh doom patrol was long gone um sandman was wound down I mean, it ended. Uh, yeah, and to your to your point, there was no real re at a certain point, and I mean, it's you know we'll see how it evolves from here. But but there was a point where when Image sort of flipped, you know, when I was at Image initially in the early two thousands, um, we kind of saw what it could be if we could just get creators to understand how it worked. Um, you know, creators who can sell their own books were guaranteed to make money at Image if they handled things correctly. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, within a few years, image launches were across the board outselling Vertigo launches. Yeah. And suddenly there's, what's the, why would I, you know, why would I give up anything to publish through Vertigo when I can do it in image? Now, I mean, there is a benefit. There's always a benefit to doing, to, to working with a company that can handle a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, that's the big thing in image is trying to, uh, you know, handle basically be a traffic manager for your own book and everything. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's just no, you know, and again, 
nothing really seemed cohesive or to make a lot of sense editorially. So that's why, you know, and, and having Mark Doyle involved um, was a genius move. Um, Mark is uh, one of the smartest guys I know in comics. Um, and, uh, and, and, and even Jamie's involvement initially was, was smart because he came out of indie comics into, into the mainstream and somehow ended up editing bad books, which I still can't quite wrap my head around, but anyway. <clears throat> well, it makes sense. Batman is essentially a horror character, no matter how he's done. It makes sense, but it doesn't make sense compared to how things usually run. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Oh, just I told Jamie that. I said, if you, if you told me. The character. Yeah, no, I get that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I told Jamie, I said, if you had told me 10 years ago, you would one day be, you know, the Batman editor. I, he was like, yeah, I would have been, I'm the same way. It's never, never where I thought I'd end up. So. Well, they had close calls in the past. I mean, when they bought, brought Bob Shrek over, I mean, um, Bob being hired to handle bat books made perfect sense to me. Um, but it seemed like there's some politics that went in. Well, there's always politics, but there's some politics that undermined what he was trying to do. And for those, for those who don't know, but might be interested, Bob Shrek, uh, actually, Bob actually mentored Jamie um, initially at Dark Horse. And then Bob was, Bob was at Oni initially with Jamie, right? Yeah, yeah. Bob was, Bob, yeah, Bob was at Oni initially. And, uh, and actually Ben Abernathy, who was the first, second editor I dealt with it at DC, who I love, but is now handling uh, like traffic manager and talent coordinator. Uh, ben learned under Jamie. Um, so it, you know, but yeah, the, yeah, those guys all kind of, kind of came out of the same, it stemmed from Dark Horse and then into Oni and then they all kind of have the same sensibilities. So I just don't, Bob never seemed, Bob, but when Bob was there, what was going on on top above, there was no, there was no cohesive. He was just kind of caught in the, I think, whirlwind of what was going on. This sort of lack of direction. You know, I mean, I don't think until recently they've really had a focus on on resetting things and finding a new direction. So, well, I mean, ultimately, it's it's it's, it's, it's whatever they'll allow you to do. You know. Yeah. I think I think that's that's, that's pretty valid. I mean, um, you, you hear you know you hear stories from inside the office. You hear you see echoes of what's happening on the outside. And you kind of put the two together and try and get a complete story. And um, it really seems that DC is a company because of its size and how much, I mean, it's, it's like one of those big cargo tankers. <laughs> they can go pretty fast if they're going a straight line, but you got to try and turn them in a certain direction. Everything stops and then everything's about turning it. Yeah. Um, and that really feels what DC is. It's got so many moving parts. And uh, it's it, it, it's in a certain sense where it's like vertigo being separate. It should never have been part of that big steerage or steering that goes on. Um, but because it is a big part part of this big boat, whenever something shifts, yeah, things are going to get knocked over. Yeah. You still there, HP? Yeah. Um, oh, um, there's. Question about ahead. Hellblazer in the comments section. Yeah, it's about to address that. Section. Okay, someone, uh, American Swordfish. Um, oh, I should. I should are you that. hyped about the? Uh, wait, hang on. There's another first one. Okay, question for the chat: Can Hellblazer work in DC Comics? For me, it doesn't work. Let me let Brian take a stab at this because Clay and I have been dominating so far. Um, no, I was just hanging back and listening, and I was enjoying it. Um, well, okay, so uh, full disclosure, I've written a version of John Constantine in this book, Michael Cray, that is uh, a Wildstorm spinoff book that isn't in the DCU, but we're sort of playing around with these DC characters. Can Constantine work in the main DCU? I, he can, to a point, right? I mean, there is, you know, Constantine is a character that has many shades, and I think what Tiny Ann is doing with him in Justice League Dark is an example of how you can make him work uh, in that context. But if one is really familiar with, you know, Ellis or or Ennis or you know, uh, Azarello, right? Any of the any of that story stuff, then it's difficult to bring that into uh, the DCU. Now, for me personally, this is personal. I don't know what the other fellows think, but 
I'm more interested in the more challenging aspects of the character and the deep dive into occultism that there. And I'm not sure that vibes too well in the superhero universe. Uh, so I guess I would prefer not to replace, not an either or situation, but I would always love to see a no holds bar John Constantine book on the stands. You know, um, a few years ago, uh, Jeremy Hahn and I were asked to pitch, uh, when Hellblazer was still in the Vertigo universe, we were asked to pitch Dr. Occult. And uh, this is one of those many, you know, we were given, we were assured that this book was going to happen, one of those deals. Um, and uh, the editor, but, but what it was, was it was intended to be sort of like Hellblazer, sort of like if Hellblazer worked in the DCU, you know, and the idea was that um, he would handle like, sort of lower level occult weird shit that's going on like below the swinging superheroes above, you know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, and I always, we always thought it was a great, you know, I mean a good, th there was a niche that could be filled there. Um, but um, the swinging superhero, but um, well, <laughs> um, I'm trying now. I'm trying to like try to tell a story without explaining how the whole thing collapsed. But uh, um, anyway, then when they brought Hellblazer in initially, and then when they did the, the Gotham book that Ben Templesmith did briefly, um, kind of was was kind of what we were angling for. But I, I've never liked the idea of having the Vertigo heroes or characters brought back into the DCU, except for the fact that they they're not doing anything with them at Vertigo that's particularly interesting. You know what I mean? So, I mean, Constantine is such a great character. He he probably works on different levels. Same with Swamp Thing. Um, I don't need to see, you know, Jesse Custer in the DCU, but um, anyway. And technically, Hellblazer crossed out of the DCU into Vertigo anyway, since Swamp Thing was initially, a, you know, it was the, with the one of the books that launched Vertigo. Yeah. Well, there's also, I mean, Constantine was a DC Universe character. That's what, yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. I, so it's 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 a little it's a little interesting to think that uh, that the type of creative limits you put on it are almost imprint bound because Constantine was proven to work in the DC universe as long as you allowed him to exist in a shadow, but as soon as you put him around hanging around with Superman, then things get a little pear shaped. Right, unless Alan Moore is writing him in Swamp Thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, that's existing in the shadow. It's it's a little bit like um, you remember. Uh, I mean, I get it's going to be Vertigo adjacent. You remember Hitman? Oh fuck yeah! Remember it, the issue of right, Hitman with uh, Superman? Yeah. Superman's all all uh, just for the audience. Superman's really really depressed. He tried to save a whole bunch of astronauts, and he, and one of them ended up dying. And he's really depressed. He ends up talking to Hitman about this, and Hitman makes him feel better. Yeah, and Superman flies off. Hey, everything's better. And then you know, Hitman waves off Superman. Then he then he assassinates somebody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And in a Superman book, you can't do that. You can't have the assassin be helpful and then murder someone at the end of a Superman book and then go merrily on his way. <laughs> but you can do that in Hitman because that was Hitman. And I think in in a in a in Swamp Thing at the time, you could do the darker aspects of the super you could have Superman wander off into Alan Moore's world. Right. And the, the readership understood this was a different place. The right. rules and gra gravity didn't have the exact same pull. The light wasn't exactly the same quality. Well, that's uh, sounds were a little different when you're in the Alan Moore DC universe book. than when you wandered off and read a Mark Wolfman Superman story. Well, that's kind of the genesis of the vertigo imprint. I mean, you yeah, know, they, they just pulled it completely out of there so that, so that it could, tilt even further to the extreme. Yeah. Well, and also with Constantine, you know, you've got, in order, I think, to really paint an accurate portrait of the character, you have to get into some of the actual roots and history of occultism, which is, yeah. it's a lot of load-bearing weight on superheroes and, you know, and, and, and that universe that can't necessarily engage esoteric belief systems, right? Mm. So uh, I think just to do it justice, that's the concept of him justice, you want to be able to get into some things that are challenging because, you know, a, a cult philosophy is a challenging thing. You know, whether you're looking at chaos magic or Anakian stuff or, you know, Luciferian stuff, wherever you're going. And I think too many times 
we see renderings of Constantine that are very kind of surface, right? It's like the Halloween costume version of John Constantine. Right, yeah. And he just says, like, flim flam, spiggy doo, and then smokes a cigarette, and we sort of gets away with it, and we're getting out of, I think, what made him really interesting. <laughs> Like the, the actual, like the the ideas, the concepts, you know, the the philosophy of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, whether you're engaging like Crowley, or even if you're looking at like Hoodoo, whatever it is. I mean, I'm I'm certainly a student of esoteric stuff. I like esotericism. I like weird history. I'm kind of into all that. So you've but been yeah, Strange Angel. What's that? So you've been watching Strange Angel? A little bit. I don't have a lot of time, bro. Like I, you know, the the time I have that's free is usually spent either like sleeping. Um, you know, uh, uh, going outside <laughs> or like some of that stuff, man. I just don't have a lot of time to watch things. Uh, but, but, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I think the, the Azarello Bermeo book is really cool. You know, Batman damned. Uh, I, I enjoy it a lot cause I love both of those creators. I love when they work together, but part of me hopes that I hope that doesn't preclude anyone from being able to do a black label Constantine book, right? <laughs> I hope I hope we can do another another dive into Constantine with some other creator that really wants to go there because it's just a really rich and interesting thing. And I think especially now, if you go to YouTube, if you look at the internet, you've got so many people that are interested in weird belief systems. <clears throat> you know, like it's back in the day, you know, it was basically the, the realm of libraries and maybe there was that one store in your city that would sell you a candle or something, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it was that kind of thing, right? Um, or you had that one like Edge Lord Metal Kid who was cool, but a little too into like the Halloween store stuff that was filling up his or her bedroom. You know? Yeah, but, he's got both uh, Anton Lavey uh, books. On. Oh, gotta have the Anton Lavey. Definitely gotta have that. You know, you gotta have a a work like a work of Crowley <laughs> that you never read, but you just have it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? They, like they, they bought it and then they cracked it open, realized it was difficult, put that away, and then they went back to uh, some of the more like retail stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, but now there's there's a ri there's a rise in just kind of independent spiritualism, you know, and I'm not putting a value judgment on it one way or another, but I think there's a market for it now that may not have existed uh, in the same way back then. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunity. Because you because you think people are, you think people are broader in their in their spirituality now. Yeah, I, I honestly, I mean, this is this gets into a little bit of like kind of kind of you know sociology a little bit, but I think in general people feel failed by authority. They yeah. feel like the traditional systems of authority have not served the world well, and now people are open to newer ideas, different ideas. Right. And I think if you did a Constantine story where you really engage the, 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 the thought process that goes into occultism, like, you know, looking at like, you know, like Jung or, or even like how it weaves its way into advertising via like Marshall McLuhan and like the medium is the message and all of that stuff. Right. Like there's, <coughs> there's, there's, I think so many different things, social media and how social media is almost like its own hive system, its own hive mind. Yeah. And what you can do with an idea in social media and, and an idea that can take form and shape and life and like do things to people. I, I just think that there's a lot there, you know, and um, I'd, I'd love to see uh, someone thoughtful come in there and really not only make something that I think is layered and, and interesting, but also something that would scare the hell out of you. Well, there's uh, that's already exists. A lot of these things that we think about as ancient occult systems and theories were the well, they're the conspiracy theories of their day. Right. right. I mean, the whole Philosopher's Stone, if you get the right types of lead and this and that and the other, and you sure. can make, you know, transform lead into gold, that was essentially a conspiracy theory. Um, the idea of what, what went into making the Philosopher's Stone, all that stuff was just. Isn't there, do you worry? I See, I worry to a degree, and I've actually thought about this. I worry to some degree about following threads like that, not like the Philosopher's Stone, but in terms of, uh, uh, people's expanded beliefs that are possibly or potentially dangerous or damaging and, you know, exploring things in that direction and giving validity to, you know, some of these completely whacked out 
beliefs and conspiracy theories that you hear now. Um, it's always fun to take conspiracy theories and run with them in fiction, but it feels more and more like at this present moment in time, it's almost dangerous to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it, but it, we also it, had, in, in Constantine, we had the British royal family being revealed as reptilians. Yeah. And on top of that, one of them was, I think, uh, they actually had Jack the Ripper still living in the royal family in one story. Uh, so I don't think it's that big a stretch to say, okay, let's play around with QAnon with Hellblazer. Mm. Well, and then in a kind of furthering your point, Clay, I think that internal discussion that you're having, right, that 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 pull that I kind of hear in you between, ooh, I see the imagination and the possibilities of this, but I also worry a bit about the responsibility of it. Mm -hmm. That could be the text of the story, right? Okay. Like there, there could be a story about that debate, you know, like – let's say someone somewhere raised some demon and the whole goal of that demon, right? The whole binding thing there is we're going to end truth. We're going to eliminate truth. Good. I want to create a society, a world where you can never find truth. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could do a whole, you know, uh, arc about right. that. And, and, and you, and I've seen, you know, you've done, you've done that in your work. You've like taken kind of those ethical ideas and surfaced them and then played the debate out in the text. Yeah. Um, and I think I do think to keep that stuff in mind for sure. I mean, definitely like, you know, you don't want to empower crazy fringe thought. I mean, with American Carnage, it is my duty to write the white supremacists in an interesting, compelling, and charismatic sure. way. I have to do that, right? Uh um, in fact, I'm working on an issue right now that in a different context could probably be a recruitment manual. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Like it could, it could play like that. Like you could rip the cover off and hand it around to people and it might be the new Turner diaries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I realize the, uh, you know, the, the risk in that, I suppose. Um, uh, but uh, I kind of always err on the side of, of creativity, you know? And well, I, yeah. I, let, let me, let me make it clear that I don't believe writers have a responsibility to be responsible um, in terms. I mean, I, 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 I would not, I'm not going to hold a writer accountable for not being responsible by opening the door to things that people want to misinterpret or what have you. For that matter, I, I don't put any limitations on, you know, how offensive you want to be. You know, I mean, uh, so I, I didn't want to, I, I, I just wanted to back up and make it say, you know, make, don't like, I'm never going to attack someone for claiming they're betraying a responsibility to you oh, know, yeah, the way they approach the work. I just wanted to make that clear because I don't yeah, believe, you know, I didn't take it that way, Clay, at all. I think, I think it's, no, I, I, no, I just want to make sure, you know, I mean, I'm completely about, you know, free and open, you know, exploration of any idea that comes into a writer's head. You know, it's like I, I was rewatching Fight Club recently because um, I'm a bit of a David Fincher stan and oh. I kind of go through the library every now and then. And, you know, and you're watching it and it's all, you know, it's all fine. You can sort of see some of the allegories to, you know, this behavior, that behavior, whatever. But you can still kind of enjoy the movie. And then you get to the end and the buildings kind of fall down. You're like, ooh, that makes me feel differently now than it did when I saw it in a theater. You know, yeah. like when I saw it in a theater and I had no worry of that ever happening in America, you know, a building just getting like intentionally detonated and brought down because of like reasons. I'm not saying the towers were brought down intentionally. I think planes crashed into them and they fell. Don't, don't Alex Jones me, but <laughs> just the, uh, the, the image of it, right. Just like, yeah. you know, like you don't look at cities and see them as fragile and vulnerable in that way. Yeah. So it was just a fantastic image. It was, it was cool. Um, but now I look at it and I'm like, Ooh, Ooh, man, that's, that's rough. So, yeah, I mean, it's always it's it's always there. I uh, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with we we live in a culture where people are constantly looking for something to platform their opinion, mm -hmm. and and it's all about like seeking out something so I can then talk about it, usually in a negative way because it's it's kind of easier to gather people around grievance than it is around positivity. Yeah, um, and I think that creates a lot of kind of irresponsible reactions to something where people don't really wrestle with the text anymore. You know, it, it's like we you could, we, we could watch taxi driver, right. Mm -hmm. And we could all have a different opinion about Travis Bickle. You know, is, is he completely contemptible or is he something of a hero in his own way? Or did he do more harm than good? Right. Discussions. Now, before the movie comes out, you know, moments would get taken out of context. People would probably pass judgment before, before it's released. And 
even seeing the movie would turn into a vote one way or another. Uh, yeah. And it's just a different kind of time that we live in right now. Uh, it's a more sanguine time, I think. You know, I'm 41, so I'm a little removed from it. Um, I'm young enough to be reckless, but old enough to not feel like I have to talk about it online. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm in that magic place where I still believe in privacy, but I also, you know, like to go ahead and kind of push the envelope in my personal life. Um, but I, th I do think it's important to have that, you know, to, to keep those things in mind, to keep the whisper of your own ethics in mind when you're doing something for sure. sure. Um, uh, and I, you know, there's no answer to it. I just think it's it, it's it, it's a call as you see it, you know. Yeah. We're also from a different time in the sense that there was there was a time in fandom where you you gravitated towards what you liked and you stayed away from what you didn't hmm. and hmm. i think there's there's there right now we're in a situation where we have to navigate people who are just as bound by what they hate as what they like yeah that's true to a degree but i mean you know there was always a it's it's funny it's kind of flipped around a little bit there used to be this sort of elitist group of critics who attacked comics for being juvenile and, and, you know, I mean, they would attack, you know, the incredible Hulk or whatever, you know, I mean, and we're talking like late seventies, early eighties, Marvel comics, which were pretty generic superior, you know, not, with, with exceptions with, you know, the, the, the great comics stood out very clearly among the rest of them. But, you know, if you go back and look at, you know, Gary Groth or the comics journals approach to mainstream comics. Um, you know, they were always lambasting comics for not being what they were capable of, I guess. And it seems to me that the more comics uh, evolve into what they are capable of, you know, some people feel like they've gotten left behind and have a hard time dealing with that. Um, but I do think that the market is broad enough now. There's something, I mean, there's no way you can't find something you'll enjoy. If, if what you used to enjoy, you don't enjoy anymore, then move on to something else. You know, I'll never understand the, you know, the, uh, the need to be permanently attached to what is essentially, you know, an invented character filtered through different creators' perspectives. Um, so. Well, it's, it's tricky too, because people, they forge these relationships with these characters and worlds in very personal ways. And as never, we all have. Yeah. Right. And you never really know how much, how much skin people have in the game, you know, right. about, about a thing. And, uh, I have to remind myself constantly that I'm a storyteller. I'm a professional storyteller. So I always feel empowered when it comes to narratives, even narratives I don't like, because I can always say, well, you know, I, I didn't care for that too much. Maybe I'll create something that fixes those problems. Sure. Um, you know, we don't have to be kind of held captive to what is created and given to us because we always feel like we can just make our own thing if we're not satisfied with what we see. Um, and a lot of people, I don't think they share that that feeling, right? So, you know, they kind of plan plan for this thing to give them X, whatever X is. X being what they received before sometimes or X being what they hope to receive. And if it doesn't do that, it can, you know, lead to a lot of acrimony. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a strange thing, you know. It's a weird thing. Um, and uh, I don't really have a, a sharp way to negotiate it beyond just being polite. And if you don't like it, hopefully you like the next one better. You know, <laughs> like, you know what I mean. I don't really know how to address it. Right? You got to do right. Uh, you got to well, do whatever, yeah. whatever you, you know, you think is the best, best thing to do uh, creatively. Um, and, uh, uh, but for anyone listening to this, you know, I, I think it's people that create things are not trying to injure people that consume things by and large, for the most part, if, if you consume entertainment, whether it's a comic book, a film, TV show, you know, novel, whatever it is, music and something about it really kind of grinds you in a, in a personal way, 99.9% .9 of the time, the person that created it isn't trying to create that reaction, right? They're right. They're thinking about what they're trying to accomplish creatively, and that doesn't mean they're trying to injure people that are consuming it and <clears throat> tend to th take things very personally. Um, uh, and and once you take something personally, you're justified to react in whatever way you want to react, right? Because now you've taken personal offense. Right. So now that I've taken personal offense, the gloves are off. Um, but it's uh, 
Yeah, it's a lot. It, it, and I think it's it's sometimes you just kind of want to go away completely from all the conversation around art and just kind of create from exile for, for, for a little while and right. just hope that it, it does OK for people. Yeah. Well, you know, I've had to, I've had to step back and, and, and ask myself what, you know, when I've had a, a negative reaction to uh, work, like an intensely negative reaction, like to where I get to that point where I want to tell somebody about it, you know, um, what I always try to do is back up and, and A, I, what I, like there are specific creators, not necessarily in comics, and I won't get into it because it's a stupid debate that I've had many times, but like particularly in film and television, there are certain writers and directors that are like n nails on a chalkboard for me, but seem to have these devoted critical, you know, popular critical um, audiences and, and and respect. And so it, it happens with some comic creators too. And I always have to step back and ask myself, okay, why am I responding? You know, what what is my response based in? You know what I mean? And very often from, from my perspective, this is a completely tangential conversation but but you made me curious about what you know you might react negatively to and, and how you how you channel that energy but um what i find is that what i what i usually react negatively to is when i feel like a creator is uh manipulating an audience um and i can see behind the curtain how i think he he or she is doing it um that's the one thing that gets my hackles up but then i have to back up and say well if nine out of ten people are loving the hell out of this work you know, why is it my job to run around and, you know, piss on everybody's sunshine, um, so to speak? Um, so what I've tried to do over the years is kind of internalize my negative responses to things and then just try to figure out how to work through it in my own work, if that makes sense. It, it, um, it does. Like, I, try, I try not to be critical of things online um, because I never – joy is precious. Happiness is precious, right? <laughs> There's there's a billion forces out there that are trying to decimate our self esteem every time we turn on any screen or mm -hmm. we walk outside. So if people find something entertaining, if it, if it makes them happy, I don't want to be any factor that reduces the nature of that experience. Uh, so I tend to not share my critical opinions of things. Um, you know, there are a lot of things I don't like. Uh, I'm pretty picky about what I choose to enjoy. You know, in recreation. Um, but because there's like so many choices out there and all of that, then you just kind of move on to the thing. I mean, I can't even watch all the things I want to watch. Right. So I, I tend to just tune it out. Like if I read five pages of a book and I don't take to it, I'll just put it away because there's a whole bookstore or an infinite amount of books. If you're going to go Amazon, um, of things I, I would also like to read same thing with TV, whatever, you know, we, we all have 500 things in our queue and Netflix of which we'll watch maybe 15 this year right right so right. there's so much stuff out there um that i just kind of tune it out like as soon as it goes foul for me i just kind of go away i'm like oh great well then i can cross it off my list and now i can go on to the next thing and and try that out you know i can go watch altered carbon now because i haven't yet and i'd like to but i was watching this other thing and oh that lost me so i'm gonna go do this thing um, well and, and i also think and i can talk to you guys about this i i think that's also the value in private channels or uh closed conversations with you know people who are trying to do what you're doing you know where you where you can be critical of a particular you know and, and kind of investigate why someone you respected you respect you know found something you're missing in, in a work of art or a television show or, or a movie I had those I enjoy that back and forth in those conversations um, and as I've gotten older I've tried more and more to sort of uh, understand someone else's perspective on something that I've had an intensely negative reaction to um, there are some things I just can't abide you know it's but but every now and then someone will make a comment or, or analyze something in a different way and and you know it'll make me realize that my knee-jerk reaction was was uh you know was a limited response you know i wasn't wasn't thinking too deeply about it or what have you so um but i don't want to take that conversation you know into the public uh i don't want to just throw it out there where it, it becomes uh like bait for people who you know don't want to have that same kind of conversation, if that makes sense. Well, sure, sure. And uh, it's, it, yeah, it, it's it's difficult to navigate um, uh, sometimes. Um, that's why, generally, I just try to fly over. 
<laughs> as much as I can, you know, I'm just going to fly over this because I don't know how to land. I don't know where to land. I don't know where it's safe to land. So we're just going to kind of fly over that and and hope it goes all right. Hey, hey, HP, if there's a question in chat that uh, you'd like us to answer, can you pull it up for us? Because I can't make heads or tails of that stream. It's just like words. It's like the Matrix. It's just going. I can't really read it. Um, I grabbed a few of them. Let's see. Um, so what is more attractive to you at the time to approach a book? Like the story, character, or art? Character for me. I pro probably art, honestly. Like I'm, I'm a visual thinker. Uh, I, 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 I used wait, to wait, buy comics. Approaching a story as a, as a creator or as a reader? I think a creator. Hmm. Kind of yeah. still. I mean, I don't know, man. Like I, it, it, the experience, like the whole of the experience is where my thinking starts. Um, yeah. So I think about like how, what, because we, we, we spoke about manipulation before. And uh, 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 the, the, not the goal, but part of what you can do as a storyteller is you're kind of a professional manipulator, right? We're manipulating emotions. We're trying to create emotions inside of people through whatever. So I tend to think about the whole of the experience, kind of what I want people to, to go through. And then things like character, uh, imagery, all that style is kind of born out of that. But I guess my initial goal is, do I want to make you laugh or do I want to scare the hell out of you? Or do I want to thrill you? Or do I want to make you fall in love, right? And it starts with that feeling, almost kind of like music in a way, like what kind of song are you going to write, you know? And then from there, uh, I start giving it form, you know, with story and character and start thinking about specificity of art. For me, it's it's um, both the art and what type of story we're, we're using the art to tell. Um, I've encountered so many scripts that are essentially TV scripts that they, they want drawn in comics. And that seems to be almost a sin against the medium. I mean, when you have an unlimited palette to... Uh, to, to show your story, to set your, uh, to create your settings for these characters, and you put them in a coffee shop. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, okay, th that, there can be a point to that. There can be an incredible point to setting your story in a comic book, in a, re in a reality that could be as bizarre as the dreaming or as mundane as scalped. Um, but there has to be a reason why you're using that setting, not just because, oh, that's where I, that's the easiest place to put, put the scene. And a lot of times I find not just, not just the writers. I mean, literally across the board, creatively people think TV when it comes to comics and not thinking comics when it comes to comics. Yeah. To Brian's point about the, well, to both your points about the whole product, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the trap of, it's been the trap for me with creator own products, creator own comics over the years um, is, is my, because they will allow you, sometimes you, you'll be allowed to uh, drag your feet or um, uh, whittle something into shape without regard to the market, if that makes sense. So um, I, you know, I, I like Hawaiian Dick is has always been years late, the comic book, the series, you know, all the way along the line to the last series, the, 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 the current current book that I'm working on. But I've because I've been so focused on trying to put the thing together the way I want it to be, because I know that ultimately it's going to be on somebody's shelves collected five or six years down the road and people won't, you know, and that's what people are going to focus on. Um, any book I've done where I've had control over more than just the script every aspect of it is, is, is just as important to me um, because people are going to come to it after the fact more, you know, people, more people will come to it after the fact generally than people who come to it initially. And um, they can forget all the drama and everything that was involved in the creation and enjoy the product for what it is. So, um, you know, as much as kind of taking that in a different direction, as much as people enjoy digital comics and stuff, that's another reason I'm still on some level always devoted to the physical um, aspect of comics. Um, I just can't, I can't imagine a work that only exists on computer monitors and digitally, you know, um, having a, sh having something you can put on a shelf and pull down and, and pass around and enjoy the whole, 
you know, the whole, the whole experience is, is, is something I still love about uh, current comics and the way that we can control how they're uh, manufactured, produced and, you know, um, displayed or what have you. So anyway, that's sort of a rambling answer to that, but I, it occurs to me that over the years um, I've been so focused at times on making sure that the product works that I've lost sight of uh, uh, other aspects of things. <laughs> that's something I'm trying to change moving forward. Um, and, and especially because if you do any work for hire, it's very, it, it's, it, it can't help but be frustrating every time at some step of the process. Um, while collaboration is great and editorial input is wonderful, um, having come up doing creator on comics where I controlled everything, I always find myself at some point of the game kind of wrinkling my nose at a, a concession I had to make, you know, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, so that's another consideration when it comes to the work you're producing is, is what compromises are you willing to make and how can you fit your vision into the editorial, combine your vision with an editorial vision, possibly working with an artist that you didn't choose to work with, you know, how at that point do you make sure that your voice stands out and that the book is still um, what you intended it to be? Um, so those are all considerations that go into any new project. So someone asked me a Michael Mann question. I think it was uh, what my favorite line is from a Michael Mann film. Um, and I, I typed it in. I don't know if people saw it. It's, it's not the best Michael Mann film, but it's my favorite Michael Mann line. It's a uh, Miami vice. And what was that? Was that 2008? No, it was older than that. Maybe 2002. Anyway, uh, no six, 2006, I think. Um, it's when Crockett is walking on the beach with the the character that uh, Lee Gong plays. I forgot what her name was. I'm not even sure they said her name that many times in the movie because I've seen the movie like 14 times. Um, and he's like talking to her about when to get out of the game. And he says, uh, 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 you know, luck runs out, you know, time, something about time, you know, time runs out. Probability is like gravity. You cannot negotiate with gravity. Uh, and the, that's probably my favorite man line because there's, that's kind of like a core Michael Mann philosophy, you know, like the, you know, Clay spoke earlier about filmmakers that he responded to and ones he didn't. I think I like Michael Mann so much because in many ways I feel like I share the perspective of a Michael Mann protagonist. I do not feel like I am in sync with the ethics of the day. Uh, oftentimes feel like we live in the world of compromise in terms of ethics and I don't like to compromise, but I also know that, that, he or she who does not compromise in a society of compromises becomes a target of that society. And you see that played out in man's work a lot. You know, it's always like the kind of the last bastion of an old set of ethics that's being hunted by a world that wants all of those ethics to go away so that things can become gray and contextual and objective truth kind of leaves. Right. So uh, I think that's probably my favorite line because it, it talks about the inevitability of defeat. Uh, um, you know, in a lot of ways and how you can only press your luck so many times before you just come up, you know, come up craps. Um, and I, 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 I think it's a succinct way to describe that. But my favorite Michael Mann film is probably Manhunter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that totally. Yeah. Uh, Miami Vice is almost like a... Uh... An indulgence in style, whereas Manhunt, Mindhunter is—you took a style and actually told a story with it. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I think directors once they get to a certain level, mm -hmm. right? And you you can pull your movie together because you get a you get a movie finance when you get enough famous people that want to do it. Yeah. That's the the difference between anyone who's who's listening to this and someone who's directing a feature is really can you get enough a listers to want to do it, and then you can get the money and then you can make it quality of script isn't really an issue honestly it's all about like can you put a team together that they want to spend money on so you know man now is in that experimental phase that filmmakers get into where sometimes you can see them making a movie entirely just to experiment with a format yeah like i don't really know how digital goes i'm gonna make a movie to find out right like i'm just gonna find out uh and i think they're i think man is in that experimental phase and, and this is just pure conjecture on my part, because I've obviously never spoken to Michael Mann about this. But I feel like Miami Vice 
was man's way to reclaim that brand before the inevitable shallower reboot movie happened. <laughs> you know, like yeah. if you're going to do this, I'm going to do this and we're going to spend $150 million on it, but I'm going to shoot it on three cell phones and it's going to be kind of like Jean-Luc Godard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, and I think that was his way of being able to kind of just do that, to like execute that the way that he, the, the way that he wanted to before it turned into like, you know, Ryan Reynolds and uh, uh, I don't know, like a, a Wayans or something. And <laughs> Because we're back in 06, right? So that's Ryan Reynolds and a Red, and a, and a Wayans. Um, yeah, I think I think that's kind of what that is. But if you, I I, I I take a lot of movies in parts. I take a lot of movies experientially. So Vice is one of those movies where I watch it all the time because I just like the feel of it. Like it makes me want to like get my aviator sunglasses and my members only jacket and go for like a night ride in LA with the palm trees and the sun's going down into orange and purple. And you just want to keep like a nine millimeter in the glove box in case you need it for extra shit. Like, <laughs> you know, like you're just in that mindset. Um, so for me, watching Miami Vice is like listening to like a, a Jay-Z album or something. It just kind of gets me hyped into a mood. Okay, and I think the movie, it's, it's the movie that does that for me. What's that? To live and die in LA. Oh man, I just watched that. I just introduced my wife to it because she's catching up on all the 80s cinema, right? All the yeah. 80s and 90s stuff I like. Uh, and we just watched that, man. Um, and that movie, that's Friedkin, right? It's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That movie's something else, dude. I've, I've always, I, that's, that's one of those things that should be a television series, could be a television series. Like you think about the AMC's and the yeah, okay, okay. No, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking of ABC, you know, with commercials, but no, 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 cable, cable. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. cable, right? But like that, that kind of exploration. I mean, I would, I would even want to see it done. Period, honestly, to like really uh, explore it. If for people who have who haven't heard of it, what we're talking about is a film called To Live and Die in L.A. It was directed by William Friedkin, the director of the uh, French Connection and The Exorcist. Uh, those are probably the movies you've heard of. It stars William Peterson uh, and um, uh, Willem Dafoe. Uh, and it's about a kind of a, a treasury agent that goes after a, a counterfeiter who's a very sort of unique counterfeiter with his own kind of sociopathic behavior model. And it's really a tale of two people just getting worse as they're trying to both avoid each other and collide into each other. Um and it's great. It's 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 a really excellent uh, uh, a film, a good '80s thriller. Um, strongly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it Friedkin it was a pastor. Friedkin yeah. was a pastor taking desperate people and making them more desperate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, talk, talk about a guy who thinks experience, right? Like you can yeah. see that Friedkin is is an experiential designer yeah. as much as he is a director. That's why his he's got one of the most varied filmographies because he'll do any genre. He doesn't care. It's like horror, fine. Action, fine. Drama, okay, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's because he goes in there and is just like, well, I'm going to figure out a way to uh, get, you know, the the audience to go here, get the audience to go there. Yeah, like with Sorcerer. I just rewatched Sorcerer uh, a couple months back. And that's another freaking... Yeah, uh, yeah Sorcerer's and great. And a lot of people, I, I think it's going through a bit of renaissance. I've, I've run into a few people recently who've recently seen Sorcerer for the first time. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, I, what was, what attracted me to it was like old video stores. Cause they had that, it had the worst VHS box cover art ever. It was just this guy collapsing in front of a, a truck on a, on a rocking bridge. And I'm like, <laughs> right. So what it's a, it's a, it's a movie about a flood. Um, but you watch it and it's, it's a remake and, uh, but it, it really is all the characters in it are so desperate and yeah. motivations are so apparent and what they go through follows so naturally from that initial desperation. And that's, that's there in to live and die in LA. That's actually there in, in Miami vice. That's there in heat. Um, all these experiential directors you're talking about seem to really understand that character desire defines movies almost more than anything else. For, for those that are following in the chat that aren't familiar with the film Sorcerer, uh, Sorcerer is a film directed by William Freakin, and it stars uh, Roy Scheider. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, put succinctly, it's 
about trafficking of uh, dangerous explosive content of uh, and d- through harrowing terrain and how can they keep from like getting themselves killed you know and that now that's a brutal oversimplification of what the movie is yeah. um but if you haven't seen it definitely check that out i mean really you can't go wrong just kind of typing william friedkin into google yeah. and i would suggest everything before jade <laughs> you know like you might want to get off at jade what he i can't remember what he did after jade oh man he well he did that one horror movie the guardian i don't know if you've ever seen that it's like this druid evil nanny movie that he did and like developed the script for and and executed it it's not not that great um but post uh jade i know he did bug i saw someone in the chat mention bug based on the tracy let's play oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i saw that yeah oh, yeah, yeah. that's a killer joe what's that he did killer that's joe. right he did do killer joe that's right yeah. that's right i think that might be the last thing he did because that's i can't think of anything since killer joe Oh, Midnight Cherry says Sorcerer is a remake of Wages of Fear. Yeah. Uh, uh, I did not know that. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think it, when we moved away from adult dramas in theaters, yeah. Uh, and, you know, Freakin was a Hollywood guy because independent cinema wasn't really what it is now then. I mean, everything was basically a studio project in one way or another, especially in the cocaine 80s. Yeah. So... I don't, I don't think Friedkin is very interested in shoestringing something for like a $5 million budget. Um, but we don't really make expensive adult dramas. I mean, you see the thing with Fincher now. Like, what does David Fincher do right now? Well, he does Netflix. Yeah. Right? He does he does that stuff because we don't we wouldn't make Seven anymore. That wouldn't be a movie in a theater these days. Uh, uh, that's it. I think Friedkin did a lot of TV to pay the bills. I seem to remember yeah. him doing a yeah. lot of TV in the 90s and 80s. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm not Tyler says Buck. Yep. Yeah, freaking made Bug. I like Bug very much. I think Bug's pretty cool. Michael Shannon, Ashley Judd. Uh, there's a third in there. I forget who it is, but it's mainly yeah. Michael Shannon, Ashley Judd. Yeah. Yeah, Killer Joe was a movie that surprised me. I was watching it before I realized he directed it. And yeah. It's, one of the, it's part of that um, uh, McConaughey renaissance period where he was like coming oh, back yeah. and like oh. just showing people he could act. <laughs> yeah, it was weird, right? Like, it's like they... There's this thing that happens to actors when they they have matinee idol looks, so they get put in these lead roles, but lead roles tend to be pretty bland. You get a lot of pages, but you don't do much within those pages. Yeah. The, the the good parts are always the second lead, third lead. That's where it gets interesting, right? Yeah. But, you know, these guys, because they can, you know, stand and look cool wearing a suit on a magazine, they get these kind of boring lead roles, and they go into this period where you're not that interested in their work i mean how many noble lawyers can you play right <laughs> you know <laughs> i mean come on right um you know romantic comedy leads and all that and uh then they kind of go away for a bit they fade and then they they kind of grind it back out uh through you know interesting indie work and and all of that i think pitt is like that brad pitt is way more interesting to me when he's not the lead like when he can be floyd in true romance yeah, I, I was just gonna say that. Yeah, right. Like that—that's the kind of Brad Pitt that I love because he's not playing his face, you know. But when you when you just put him in something, you know, we, we, when they do like the baby Redford thing with him, yeah, I, I just it just falls flat for me because I just think he's a more interesting actor. Uh, well, he doesn't know. seem engaged. I think the only time I've ever enjoyed a movie where he did that was uh, Benjamin Button. Well, well, yeah, because look how dynamic that work is, though. Yeah. Right? yeah. And you know, it was playing, I mean, as young and pretty as he was, even as an actor, because he's, he's really such a good actor. You can see him playing a much older man in that body. Totally. Like a, a guy named Max Hammer says that Pitt was great in California. Yeah, California is a cool movie, man. It's very 90s, California. Yeah. It's uh, Michelle Forbes, Brad Pitt, Juliette Lewis, and David Duchovny. Yeah. Uh, and the 90s and David Duchovny, dude. Like, it is if you have Michelle Forbes and David Duchovny in your movie, your movie is happening in the 90s. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter like when you wrote it, if you shoot it right now, that that joint is 90s. Yeah, um, but California is cool. It's about uh, a he's a doctor, right? Like, he's a doctor that gets disgraced and then has to like figure his oh, he that's right, he's like roped into saving someone's life and then gets roped in with these like criminals. Uh, it's it's cool. Uh, I forgot who directed that movie, but I really, really dug it as as a kid. 
It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, a lot of people forget he was in 12 Monkeys. He was probably the most energetic part of 12 Monkeys. Uh, totally. Brad, yeah, sure. Brad Pitt seems to be like of that, that of his generation that came in at that point, it seemed like a lot of people realized if I just do the leading man stuff, my career is going to go straight in the tank like McConaughey's did. Mm -hmm. So you have people like uh, Matt Damon, uh, Brad Pitt, George Clooney all saying, you know what, I'm going to do something weird, then I'm going to do something mainstream, then I'm going to do something weird again. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I think about uh, that that heist movie where George Clooney was entirely in a wheelchair. And he was coordinating like this low-rent period heist movie. Oh, my God, I'm blanking on the name of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It was such a cartoon. I, I got I got to catch up on my Clooney. Uh, I like Clooney a lot. Like I love Michael Clayton. Um, yeah. I've seen that movie like you know a, a bunch of times. Man, Tony Gilroy on the writing and the directing on that one. Tilda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a, it's, it's funny. There's a there's a there's a book I did called Romulus that not a lot of people knew then, but more people are finding now because I've written the Batty Man. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> when you write the Batty Man, people start looking up your your stuff. And there's a scene in Romulus where the the villain, uh, uh, she's standing in front of a mirror, um, kind of going through what she's going to say. And that was my nod to Michael Clayton, you know, because what's and I think this kind of applies to comics, too. What's, what's really remarkable to me about uh, Clayton is it paints an equal portrait yeah. of of the villain to the hero. And, and even the hero is compromised. And and the first moment you spend with Tilda Swinton's character you're sympathetic with her because she's struggling. And yeah. then you learn later, like, oh, you're one of those evil lawyers that cheats people out of their money all the time. Um, and I, I mean, Gilroy is a master of the craft. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I love his writing. Anyone who's a writer who is following this chat, I strongly suggest you go track down Tony Gilroy's screenplays. Track down Michael Clayton. My, my, my Clayton. Mike, my, Michael Keaton? No. We'll track down Michael Keaton and tell him he did a great job in Batman. Then... <laughs> Track down Michael Clayton and watch it. <laughs> that's that's the thing. Uh, I'm not Tyler says Thief second best man. I like Thief a lot. Uh, uh, James Conn's performance is awesome, and they're Jim Belushi. I'm a big fan of Thief. Yeah. Where Clayton? Yeah, did he actually, move play? one, two, he he actually dropped out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, so he dropped out a while ago. Yeah. I guess he, I guess he's not a fan of Michael Mann. <laughs> We can talk about Zemeckis. <laughs> we can, you know, we can talk about you know Wes Craven, whatever. Um, am I missing any 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 like questions from the uh, from the thing that are? Uh, this is like a, I guess this is a question for HP. Am I missing something there that I should answer? Uh, I don't. Did know. I read Stardust? Uh, that's Nasser's book. Oh, okay. I'm I'm terrible with titles. Uh, have it looked at it. Looks very good. Have not given it a good read yet. Um, don't be offended. There are tons of things. If you can see my office right now, I have an inbox that is st stacked up. Look cool. Have not actually read it yet. I'm a really slow reader, guys. So uh, I like to actually sit with something and give it time. So I don't like to just kind of flip through something and say like, yeah, I read it. I like to give an informed kind of kind of thing. So if anyone has a finished book out there that they DM me or something and uh, they wanted me to read it, it takes me time. It takes me time. Yeah, same here. I just got sent three more books to read today. Uh, yeah, I, 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 read I, picked, I picked up Romulus when HB put me onto it and I still haven't had a chance to read it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it was me learning the ropes, I think, of doing something superhero-y. Uh, uh, for those uh, in the chat, so Romulus, the, the short elevator pitch is it's Buffy the Illuminati Slayer, uh, and it's about uh, it's about a young woman raised as an assassin by a secret society, and then she turns against them to kind of take them all down, and and things happen. Uh, and it was it I you know I, I wrote Postal for a long time, and Postal is a book where people talk by trees, and occasionally people get like shot in the face, and and that's. The, the way kineticism worked in postal uh, for those those years. But Romulus was the first time I really got to try to do kineticism. Uh, and I think I combined too many influences. I had a little too much Frank Miller here, a little too much that there. Um, but I, I do love the world and the character and would like to revisit it uh, at some point, for sure. 
Um, so I saw a question for me. I know it's, it's sorry, guys. It's so hard for me to see. Oh, what? It's, uh, crazy. What superhero comic would I like to see David Fincher direct? Huh. I don't know. What about you, Richard? What superhero comic would you like to see David Fincher direct? <clears throat> hmm. That's a weird one because Fincher is gonna would recreate himself for whatever he brought himself to. Yeah, yeah, uh, you, you can see like I I want to know what the the comic book meeting with Fincher is like. Hey, man, you want to do this? Yeah, you know, like wouldn't it be cool if Superman like killed everybody? <laughs> and, well, I don't, you know what? You know what? He'd do the Ben Urich movie. Oh well, yeah, yeah, sure. In that space, I could certainly see him uh, yeah. do that. Uh, I think he'd do a really cool shadow if you wanted to do that. Like, yeah, there's a like, there's like he updated it with all the uh... yeah. <laughs> give, him, give him a Howard Shakin shadow to do. <laughs> oh, totally. Well, you know, yeah. Fincher Fincher has a, a this precision about his work. Yeah. Um, and almost to the point where it gets a little antiseptic at times. Like, you know how sometimes Kubrick's movies feel like you're walking through a hospital? Yeah. Because everything is perfectly placed, the compositions are perfectly there, and you can feel the weight of the 75th take. Yes. You know? Like, you just well, can it, feel it, like... Worse with, with um, Fincher because of uh, the way he actually will assemble a frame. Right. I mean, with um, where he'll actually use a performance from take 12 from this actor and a performance from take 72 with this actor. And then you'll decide that this little background element doesn't work. So he'll actually digitally put in the background that he, he went into after take 105. I have a, I have an issue with that, right? Like I, 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 I get why, look, if you have the power, you know, with the ones and the zeros to digitally control your image to that point, I certainly get the seductive quality of that. Yeah. But simultaneously, I don't know. Like, I, I don't. I think it would be odd for actors to not know what part of what performance is going to wind up in the thing. You know, it's 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 rough enough when you know you've done seventy takes or fifty takes of walking down a flight of stairs. But yeah. it's when you compound that with, uh, you know, the different different takes. I'm going to take a bit of four and I'm going to put it with nine. I'm going to combine it together. Maybe I'll digitally alter the expression a little bit. It gets weird. I mean, you know, if Sheridan was on here, maybe he would have more insight because of his uh he works with Reznor a lot. I'm sure they've got some Fincher anecdotal stuff there. I've never met David. Um but I do admire a lot the it stamina, right? Like I've made some short films, never made a feature. Um, but every time I I, I step into filmmaking, I'm reminded of how much stamina it takes to keep yourself that focused for that long. When I was working on Titans and I was on set for that show uh, and my, both my episodes were, they were shooting back to back. So I wound up being in Toronto for about six weeks. Uh, and four of those weeks was just straight production, pure production. Okay. Side point. Next time you're up in Toronto, let me know. Oh, most definitely, man. I didn't know. I didn't know anybody up there, you know, when I was up there, but if I go back there, I'll let, let you know. All right. And, and we worked Fratter days a lot, um, uh, which is like working super late on Friday up until dawn on Saturday and then you sleep it off Saturday and then you try to recover your soul on Sunday and then you get back on Monday. Yeah. And the, the stamina that it takes to, to look at that monitor, to look at those performances, to make sure that the collar isn't weird or the other thing isn't weird, or there's nothing going on in the background or, you know, you have a script supervisor that's working on it. But when it comes to things like actual dialogue delivery and blocking and that, that's, that's the director's gig. Yeah. So the the fact that Fincher can not only easily have the the attention to detail that any director has, but to have that compounded with his hyper attention to detail is is incredibly impressive. Especially when you remember, it takes David nine months to shoot a movie. He's shooting for nine months. You know, yeah. like like Rooney was pretending to be Elizabeth Salander for about 60 days, I think, with Trish Summerfield, the costume designer, like yeah. hanging around in, in L.A., like riding the L.A. train in yeah. costume just to kind of fade away. And then after that, you've got eight months of shooting, you know, uh, with David, who does maybe like a page a day or something or a page and a half a day or half a page a day or something. So, yeah, the stamina on that is wild. And so seeing him, to go back to your point, Richard, with the Chaken, yeah. 
to see Fincher try to adapt that, he could actually really make those images come alive yeah. in, in a real way. Because he would kind of see what they were doing in two dimensions and translate them to three, and I think it would be uh, uh, really great. Yeah. I, I don't know that... Because, um, I mean, there's a story that he's going to be doing the sequel to World War Z, and I don't know how far that's going. I don't know. If, it, it might be one of those things that will never happen. That sounds like him and Brad had a beer and they made a phone call and got a green light for development. <laughs> that's that's what it sounds like to me. Because, right? Like, you just called your boy up and be like, yeah, I bet we can get somebody to pay for this. Yeah, I, it, but it's like uh, I, I rewatched, I went and rewatched the movie again after the story broke. And I was trying to think what the hell Fincher could hang his hat on if not going back to the book and then saying, well, let's let's make the book now because they didn't really do much with the book. In, mm-hmm. the, in the first movie, yeah, um, and that's all I got. And then it's been what four years since they announced that, um, and yeah. nothing. So I don't. I, I'm convinced it's going to be one of those things that'll never happen. Scheduling, man. You know, Brad makes what like a movie maybe every every couple years. He'll make one, um, and then he just raises his kids in between. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and David takes a year to make a movie. It's it's probably as hard to line all that up simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then we you know, remember he was sort of contracted for the Dragon Tattoo trilogy, yeah. Until they decided that they w- weren't going to do the last two of, of the initial trilogy, and then they were going to kind of re- not reboot, but you know, recast and get Eddie Alvarez to do the next one. So he yeah. might have just been hanging up in the cut. I had a meeting w- once. I had a meeting with Morgan Freeman's company about Rendezvous with Rama uh, because he had been speaking to David about wanting to do that, and I never met with David. But I you did get to have a conversation with uh, 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 Morgan for, for a, a hot second and then his executive for the rest of it. And we talked a bit about Fincher. And it sounds like working with him is as crazy as it seems. Like crazy in a good way, but it is that crazy. I've, I've got some friends who uh, most of my connections are generally through the production visual development end. Sure, sure. And so I've had some friends who worked at, uh, at the ranch for Lucas, worked for Fincher over the years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I understand the crazy is there. I love that Sigourney, by the way. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that your your Google Hangout thingy is that is that oh. you? Yeah, that um, I did these little warm up sketch cards. So that's uh, a little two by three sketch of Sigourney. I did uh, that's amazing. All the cast. Oh, I can probably send you JPEGs. I love that. Like I've I've seen people try to capture that moment of Alien before, but that's the best of that I've seen. Like that really, that's it. Like that, Sigourney seems like someone that's difficult for people to get. <laughs> like you know, like you, like that looks like Sigourney, right? It, it's like that looks like Ripley. I'm seeing just a very small sliver of it. I knew who it was, but I've seen a lot of people try to do Sigourney, and it kind of looks like Sigourney. Kind of captures her, but not not quite there. So those are cool, man. Please, I'd love to see those shapers. Okay, I want to see you do a screen share here. Good Blue, adventure, blurry, actually. Kobe Bonham uh, asks, but could Fincher actually make a successful video game movie? Sure. I mean, I'd love to see Fincher's Silent Hill. I'd love to see Fincher's PT. You know, uh, um, I'd, I'd love to see that kind of work. Oh, man, those are awesome. Thanks. Those are really, really cool. So yeah. those were like sketch cards you gave away at cons and, and like, uh, no, I just, I just did them for myself. Cause, um, I got tapped. This is when I was not drawing comics. I was doing like, uh, illustration and, and design and concept work. And a bunch of my friends started doing these, uh, sketch cards, like these incredibly tiny little freaking sketch cards. Yeah. yeah. And I started doing them and it was like the money they were paying was a joke. I didn't understand why anyone was doing them, but I liked the challenge of drawing really, 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 Small. They're essentially like tiny panels. Sure. Yeah. So I, I just finished uh, rewatching Alien, so I figured uh, I went through and I just did some uh, some drawings based on uh, the photo novel. I have the Alien photo novel, which was oh. one of my treasures. That and Outland. And um, oh, I got I got I have the um you know the big like uh uh like kind of marketing magazine like things they used to make with films. Oh yeah yeah. I have I have the the Outland one of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. I uh, went to the last bookstore here in uh, downtown LA, and I I was able to pick it up. I just saw it like you know it was like a dollar, and I was like, oh no, this I, you know, <laughs> it, it, I have to cop this. Um, it's like my cherished uh, collection thing. Uh, 
real quick the fist says brian you're running detective has been great man well thank you fist uh i appreciate that um and I'm sorry I'm missing the questions, guys. Like it, they're they're going really fast, and so I kind of scroll up every now and then. Um, so, so Richard, tell me a bit about uh, the the process you're taking on the Vertigo book, man. What's that? What's that like? Um, it's it's good. It's a little bit more talking heady than I thought it was going to be. Hmm. Um, I thought like if you're if you're uh, dealing with um, essentially uh, Superman with the serial numbers filed off, you get that whole toolbox of Superman action. Right. And uh, then then as soon as you crank open uh, the whole Judeo-Christian Jesus-God relationship, you have all that. So I did a huge dive into um, what all the early 60s, 70s uh, Superman visuals were on top of like just doing obscure research into like what angels actually looked like according to various texts. So, uh, so talk, talk to me a bit about when you when you're doing something and you've got a lot of conversation in your script. Yeah. How do you as an artist approach that to make it interesting? Do you know, like what are what are some of the things you consider um, when you're when you're gonna kind of scene on the page? Well, there's 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 a number of uh, it, it, it comes down to process. Any anything where you have to do something systemically over an extended period of time, you have to have a process, otherwise things get you know chaotic and jumbled. Uh, a lot of it means going back to your eyes there, like when you first learned about like how to do page design hmm. um, and designing how and, th and thinking about reading the, the story itself and deciding how does this story best translate into visuals on this page? Do you need to do like, like uh, thinking about Mr. Miracle with the nine panel grid where the entire series is nine panel grid and and how it was used differently from Watchmen's nine panel grid? Right, right, right. Um, that was that was that was those are people who understood um, the graphic imp importance of that proscenium arch that formed shape that the reader would eventually learn to ignore and just take the content away. As soon as you step away from something like that, as soon as you step away from the nine panel grid or the six panel grid, um, you end up having designed pages and you're making you're actually intervening in how the reader is going to follow the story. Right. And and that's uh, when you were, um, how to best put this, I would say in the 80s, 90s, when the average panel per page count was six, um, yeah, there was yeah. more of a standard uh, rhythm where you could actually use something like the standard proscenium arch or the beat, 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 beat uh, sense of storytelling. Now that everything seems to be five. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I start with five. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, Richard. So when I was working with Warren on uh, uh, Michael Cray, yeah, I, I saw some of his scripts. Yeah, and I saw how in the script it's like he, the default is a nine-panel grid. Yeah, and then he'll like get rid of the individual panels, but like keep the rest of the grid, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I had to work in there to kind, of, to kind of match the experience with Wildstorm and Michael Cray, which is a little tricky for me. But coming out of that, I just started going to five panel page. Like I just, that's where I do, man. I just like, okay, five panels is the average amount of panels I put in a page. Um, and then I, you know, I'll take it up and take it down as I need to. But yeah, yeah, I totally, I, I thought I was the only person that was doing that. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was like a standard. Yeah. It's frightfully cool. common. It's frightfully common. Um, I think, See, I approach when I write my own stuff. Yeah. Um, I approach things from a, a beat, like a story beat. Every page has to have one specific beat. And I, I have to design the page to get that beat across. So if, if, if the beat on the page is a conversation between two characters and I need nine panels to tell that beat, then that page has nine panels. Whereas I think there's been a transformation in, in terms of um storytelling starting starting around I, I guess they called it widescreen storytelling yeah uh, yeah where everything had more air than i i as an artist feel it needed um right which is weird because i mean uh, artists everywhere universally hate like nine panel pages um oh really like the, the, you see a grid and you're just like Ugh. Uh, yeah, when I was younger, that was absolutely it. But I realized how important it is to the end result to the page contains what the page needs to contain. If, if I run into, uh, let's say, a three-page sequence, 
and two of the pages are talking heads. But it takes those two pages to get that one story point across. I feel, and I could be wrong, this is, again, every creator has their own um, way of doing things, but I feel that those two pages should have been one page. Yeah, yeah. If it's the one beat, that page should be the beat. And if, if honestly, if, if it takes more than one page to do a beat, then maybe you have to rethink how you're trans trans uh, um, translating that beat in your imagination into a story moment. Yeah, it's, you know... So in American Carnage, I have a a few grid pages. You know, it's not a full it's not fully like gridded out. It's it's you know it's got its lean panel counts too. Yeah. But I tend to script a grid if I want the conversation to happen in a truncated amount of time, mm -hmm. and I and I really want the reader to think about the relationship of each of the individual moments that make up the whole of of the page and. You know, it's like that Frank Miller rule, you know, like one panel, one moment in time. Yeah. Um, and I remember way back in the day, I did this uh, one shot with um, Phil Noto. I was really, really lucky to get Phil Noto on this thing I did called Seven Days from Hell, back for Top Cow Image. And there was a, a panel, a page that was like a nine panel grid. And I remember I just wrote the script and I'm pretty bare bones in my script. I don't put a lot of detail in there. I like, you know, for the, for the, the penciler uh, to like interpret it as much as possible because i just want to see what the illustrator gets from it but phil emailed me back and he's like is she just gonna look the same way in all of these panels and i'm like okay tell you what i'll go through and i'll and i'll give you a little bit more detail for each expression <laughs> and then we'll see where we are so i went through and it was almost like directing an actor you know like how would i want to direct this actor well, I'd want to see this here, this here, this here, this here, this here, this. And I sent that to Phil, and he was like, oh, okay, I know how to execute this. And what he did was really, really great. I actually have a, uh, can't see it now, but I have a poster of that nine-panel grid that's like hanging oh. up in my in my writing office. Um, but I think there, there was a question for you here uh, about economy of panels, and I lost it. Oh. Okay. Or do you got it? Yeah. Any lessons? This is for you, Richard. Okay. Any lessons for an economic use of panels on storytelling? I guess as a writer or an artist, you know, this is this is um, this is pretty key because I find I, I every once in a while um, my storytelling gets a little fatty. Uh, there's a there's this kind of desire to do slow motion, like show all the action in a lot of people's storytelling. I see it when I do portfolio right. reviews a lot, and a lot of times the action itself isn't as important as the imagery telling the story. Um, mm -hmm. totally. It really should always be the minimal amount of panels to get the information across. And the reason why you descend into doing, I, I'm thinking probably most famously the uh, uh, the scene from uh, Dark Knight Returns where Bruce's parents get killed, and oh, yeah. we, we, um, his 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 16 panel grid has transformed into each panel being a fraction of a second. So, so we so we actually have freeze frames of the pearl necklace being ripped apart by uh, Joe Chill's gun. Um, that is still economical storytelling because Frank had decided this moment is so important, I'm going to stretch it out to fill this much space. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, this goes back to something. I, I think I really discovered this for myself in teaching it to students. When I taught a uh, design and composition for visual narrative class in an animation program, I talked about the use of space and its importance. And, and so if you have a tiny figure in a vast landscape, what you're telling the viewer of this image is that the landscape is more important right. or it's overwhelming the small figure. The small figure is overwhelmed by the space. And narratively, when you're doing panels, what you devote your time and your space to tells the reader what's the most important thing. So right, when, when right, you have right. that kind of like knee-jerk response to image style comics from the 90s, where you have just this massive action shot, what you're doing is, is you're almost saying, I'm going to make a storytelling point, something that would be in the trailer for this movie. Whereas, whereas in terms of story, the big, big, flashy, you know, character jumping through the plate glass window thing may look cool in the comic book, but in reading the story, it may have may have been something that probably should have been smaller. Well, that's something I had to learn. Like, 
you know, when I started writing comics, I was running out of pages super quickly. Yeah. And I realized that's because I'm writing storyboards. Yeah. And I'm yeah, thinking a number of right? storyboards. I'm I'm thinking I'm I'm writing a script and thinking about each individual shot that I would want to do. And the thing I'm still learning how to do it. Um, luckily I've been able to work with some really advanced illustrators like Dexter and Leandro. So they're they're great to work with and I can go back and forth with them, uh uh with Juan Ferreira, you know, we can have these conversations. Yeah. Oftentimes I have to figure out, oh wait a minute, what do I what are the moments I can leave out? And and what moments like what two moments and now we're getting into like weird gestalt film theory but yeah. what two moments will imply all of the moments in between <laughs> right? like, exactly. well, that's 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 what happens in the gutter in a comic book yeah totally and thinking you know having the instinct for the gutter is something that i've spent a lot of time the uh, working with like over the past years as long as i've been working on comics that's really been the rock i've been pushing up the hill is thinking about how to make those gutters imply a bunch of things with the the images that we see. Uh, if you look at some of my early work, I just have too many shots of things. Yeah. Yeah, I was just given a script a while ago, not not the Vertigo project I'm working on. Someone else wanted me to draw something. And yeah. there were needless panels of like, someone walked up to an apartment, you see him go in and walking down the hallway of the apartment, they see them unlocking the door of the apartment and then see them going into the apartment. Oh, somebody sent you one of my old scripts. <laughs> <laughs> and it brought, brought to mind something that, again, something I, I ended up touching on when I was teaching uh, composition for visual narrative. Yeah. If you look at older black and white movies, mm -hmm. okay, um, they would have scenes where there'd be two characters talking on the telephone. And the person, I'll be right over, and they'll hang up the phone, and you might get a shot of them leaving the house to their car. And the storytelling importance at this point in time in history was that you had to see that the person left their house and was going to the car. And then right. you would cut to a shot of the car driving down the road, and that would tell the audience, look, he drove. And then you'd have a shot of them arriving at the new place. And then maybe they could actually be a little, little, you know, show a little economy and just have them walking into the room with the other character. Yeah. Nowadays, you can yeah. have a person like hang up their phone, say, "I'll be right there," and you cut to them together already doing something. It's, it's the audience is much more sophisticated and can understand that all that that transitory action has occurred. Well, you know, it, it, there's, there's a couple things there you said that are really interesting. One, it's always really fun to me to talk to people who've watched a movie that I'm really familiar with yeah. and to hear how much of the movie that they saw in their head that isn't actually in the movie. Yeah. And especially if it's, you know, like a scene of graphic violence or something or a big action sequence, like memory of what you saw is different than what's actually there on screen. And, yeah. and the other thing you, uh, you know, you, 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 you brought up, oh, I forgot your second point. I was so excited about the first point, but I forgot your second point. You were talking about the, uh, the offer. It'll come to me, but yeah. Like how we interpret, Oh, you were talking about sophistication. Yeah. Well, that's the compound factor quality of, of art. You know, as we create it, people get more fluent in it. As we get more fluent in it, we can start using more and more shorthand. Yeah. And, when you look at old movies, part of why it's so hard for younger people to watch older films is they have none of the shorthand, so everything feels like it takes forever. Yeah. You know, like you, but when, when people, contemporary people were watching Citizen Kane, they'd never seen something like that before. Exactly. You know, that was stupendous in terms of its stuff. I was having a conversation with someone about uh, 2001, and they were talking about how languid it is, how slow it is, how paced it is, they got to struggle with it. Uh, and that's because we're so used to seeing spaceships. We're so used to seeing special effects yeah. that it's not remarkable to us anymore. But for audiences back then, and I believe it was the late 60s when the movie was released, yeah. they've never seen those kinds of effects in a theater. Like, they've never seen those images before. So that woman walking upside down around the thing, that was magical. You know, it's... Yeah, it's Velcro shoes. Yeah, right? Yeah. Similar to like the great train robbery when the train comes right at the screen and people like got out of the theater and ran away back in like 1912 or whatever. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that, that's a I think it's a really important point this this idea that as people are exposed to art, 
they start to get more fluent in it and then art starts to evolve and then the shorthand develops and develops and develops and develops. I mean, I think it's part of the reason why I have such a difficulty trying to get into manga because a lot of the manga audience, they're so familiar with how manga works yeah. that they can just kind of read it. But for a lot of it, I can't really make heads or tails of it. One, it's hard to read backwards. I'm just not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You <laughs> will get up. used to it after a while. I woke her up with the manga. Um, well, I, I like Biomega a lot. I like uh, Blame a lot. Uh, and um, uh, Blade of the Immortal. Those are the ones that I've read uh, most of. Yeah. Blade of uh, the Immortal, uh, uh, Shogun Assassin, and Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. <laughs> Lone Wolf and Cub, right. Lone Wolf and Cub was like my gateway drug. That, <laughs> that's because I, cause I, I saw the, the 70s, you know, hyper violent samurai movie. And then it's like, ooh, I want more of this. What is this? And they're like, oh, you should check out Lone Wolf and Cub. Uh, but yeah, like you can see, and especially in the same manga series, like volume six is operating on a whole different level than like volume one is. Yeah. <laughs> like volume one is like getting introduced to everything. Volume six, there's a grammar. It's why if you try to like watch the last season of Dragon Ball, it's madness. Yeah. You know, like it's, it, it, it looks like someone's pointing a strobe light at my face and turning it on. But if I if I can watch it from the beginning, I can kind of get brought up and I can read those moments there. I just thought that was a really interesting point about how I never really thought about that, about how exposure to something compounds our familiarity, which allows the next iteration of that thing to be even more efficient and use a better shorthand. Yeah, it's um, it's a little bit like um, if you ever seen Bullet, the Steve McQueen movie with the the infamous car chase. Oh, have I seen Bullet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, within a handful of years, all the technology, all the special effects, all the camera work that they used in Bullet was on TV. And right. yeah, and it made it less special to people who didn't care about where it came from. And and that that's that's the situation we're in 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 terms of narratives where. Um, trying to think of the best example for in, in terms of like um, becoming shorthand and then being taken for granted. Uh, I would think that a lot of the imagery, the way way a lot of the over the top imagery in the '90s, the image in it, at late late phase Marvel, came from what Frank Miller and Howard Chaykin were doing just a few years previous, uh, uh, either on Dark Knight or American Flag. Yeah, yeah. The idea of like we can do this image, and this image is going to be so important. The viewer, the reader of the book is 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 just going to be overwhelmed by it. And then it became like, oh, we need a money shot in this book. And that was actually the term comic artists were using. It's it's a porn term, but they were using it in, co in comics. It was like I was talking to other pros, and say, yeah, this page, it's a money shot, right? And it didn't have narrative weight, but they knew on the stands, people flipping through the book, they, they see Wolverine, you know slashing through the side of a tank and then you know with forced perspective on his claws and his face and everything this page this page will sell the book um it was it was a weird way of things that were developed from a narrative standpoint being taken over degraded um and ultimately being taken for granted by the people later using it and then the audience itself yeah yeah so it there is sophistication to it when it's used well and then there's just kind of like um uh, an insulting commonality to it when people just use it for the grossest effect. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we don't paste things anymore. No. And that's the part of why we can't... You know, so much of, of creating things is about trying to replicate the experience we had that made us fall in love with stories. Right? Yeah. We kinda, we're, we're always chasing that experience, right? And... You know, it's kind of like whatever the first girl is or first guy you fall in love with, you're always sort of looking around for somebody to sort of remind you of that feeling. And um, it's it's difficult because culture change, culture changes and everything kind of shifts and it's hard to, hard to recreate that. And part of that is pace. It, it's because we have movies like Dark of the Moon, for instance, Transformers, you know, verb of the adjective noun. Um <laughs> I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> so I just, whatever, you know. And, and that movie is always on 10. Like, it was on, like, I saw it on Netflix the other day, or it was, like, something, and I just turned it on, and it was just, it, it, it was just always at 10. It never paced itself. It never slowed down. 
and you were exhausted by the end of it. And it's like a two and a half hour movie. So it's like getting your foot stepped on for a while. Um, uh, the example I used to use would be you open up the first page of your comic book and you blow up the X-Mansion. And on page right. two, you blow it up again. And on page three, you blow it up again. <laughs> you blow it up, yep. And it's like, it's if, if you have this big image, and a lot of people, I think, I think possibly the first big narrative weight image that that transcended comics was Bullseye impaling Electra in Daredevil. Oh yeah, Richard. Like I remember seeing that image before I even knew what it was because like the 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 side didn't quite go through the cloth. Yeah, you know, you're like, oh, that's some reason stuff. that just made but, it too real, right? Yeah, but. It was it was such an important it was it was the proper use of pacing. It was it was opening up the space in such a way to allow the moment to be more important on the page, to be more important yeah, yeah. in context of everything that happened before or after it in the comic book. It was a it was a good use of it wasn't even a splash page, but it, but but even if it was a splash page, it would have been well used. It was the best possible use of narrative, uh, dramatics and imagery. And right. a lot of people have walked away from the idea that that imagery dramatics has to have dramatic weight too. Right, I mean, right. it, 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 there's a certain hollowness. I remember, I remember one, uh, one of the low points of of '90s comics were turning the book sideways because you had a sideways splash page. Yeah, yeah. A Stumptown recently had that driving sequence where yeah. you had to turn the book, you know, a certain way to look at it. And I think you, when you did that, you got this great image of the dashboard and the speed indicator, and you saw, like, the street. It was really effective what they did. And I, I forget, I think it's, like, volume two, I think, um, or volume three where they do that in there. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that... Well, that, that's, 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 that's actually a great example because I mean, even in Promethea, where you ended up turning the book 180 degrees to read it, Right. There was a very postmodern uh, meta approach to you're physically changing how you're reading the book because the book itself is changing how you read it. Whereas in something like, I don't know, um, Too Many Bullets comics, uh, turning the page sideways because the artist wanted to draw um, your, your cable rip off really, really big on two pages 11 by 17 taped together. Um, with no narrative sense for why you're turning the comic book sideways other than it's bigger. Uh, it right. has that spinal tap. It's, mind goes to 11 aspect. It's, it. it's bigger. <laughs> I've, I've gotten that note sometimes. And, I, and I'm like, why, why do you want this to be a splash page? Because it's not particularly interesting. This moment is more, this one is much more interesting than this one. Sometimes I think they want you to cheat in a poster into the book, man. You know, I think sometimes it's this is a cynical uh, take, so yeah. forgive me. But sometimes I think it could be about developing dual purpose imagery. So let's say you're working with me on a book, right? You're yeah. illustrating the book, and and I'm writing the book, or writing the book together. However, we're working on this thing, and yeah. it's a superhero thing. Uh, well, if they get a you know full page uh, splash page illustration from you, well now they can wrap that around a coffee mug. Right? <laughs> That's true. That's you true. know what I mean? Like you can sell that. Like that can turn into a thing. And I do think that sometimes it's about we need more library images of these characters. You now we need them just like looking cool, holding gun. You've seen it before, but we need new ones. Um, uh, uh, I don't get don't get a lot of those notes, especially recently. I haven't gotten any on any of the recent projects, but some other stuff I've done, I've gotten that. And like well, you don't really want to tell the story here. You just want to get this person doing a poster for you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm fine with that. Whatever you know, dealer's choice, but. But yeah, um, that kind of pacing and the rhythm of all that um, is is something I'm still working with. This real quick, someone asked me about Troll Two. I have I'm going to take the question seriously because I just have, don't have time to not. So I I'm I'm kind of fond of the B movie Troll series. I don't remember Troll Two. Uh, I remember more about one, strangely enough. But I remember it being fine. <laughs> so for their if they're, if they're actually legitimate fans of the troll franchise out there know that Brian Hill thinks troll 2 is a fine film um there's I, another I, question um what new theme um would you want to see that really hasn't been heavily approached in comics 
I mean, like, uh, like subject matter or? Uh, I think so, yeah. Or genre. Well, I'm working on an original thing right now that I can't get into um, yet that we, we're we really trying to do interesting things with vehicular motion in the comic book. You know, the, the nature of the story means that we got to make the cars work. And we occasionally see stabs that, you know, Sean Murphy is really good at it. Uh, yeah. uh, he builds things around it. And, and that's really why I started studying manga, Richard, was to get into Gunsmith Cats. You know, to see okay. yeah. how do they make this satisfying? Because I don't know how to make this satisfying innately, um, and it's a it's a it's a finite project. So it, it's it's the great thing about that is I can kind of put all my best stuff into you know the number of issues it's going to be. But the challenging thing is you really want it to kind of cook off of the page. And and I don't know about you, uh, but I have this thing where when someone tells me it can't work well in a comic book, then I get obsessed with trying to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so. it always falls apart because there's always someone who can make it work well in comics. And you just got to say, well, Murphy or Panosian or go back right. a little further and say Chris Piccolo, they can make, they realize that the strict rules of perspective don't matter right. uh, when you want to convey action in, in an animate object. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of the projects I'm working on for myself is entirely based on a character driving a motorcycle everywhere and oh, okay. yeah, um, yeah. that has to have hello alien, alien signals i think someone was grapefruiting your mic i think you're good now okay cool anyway you were just a motorcycle Comic book. Well, it's it's um you have to I, I haven't draw, haven't had cause to draw a lot of motorcycles, right? So because I'm developing for this for like the long term, I'm sketching motorcycles. I have these little uh, precision replica motorcycles. I'm just sketching, and it's it's about comfort with the vehicle. Uh, the more comfortable with the vehicle you get, the more you can actually play around with it expressively. Well, you know the the, the thing that I also try to do is. Like for this car thing uh, I'm working on, I, I just tried to experience speed behind the wheel, you know, by like rolling out with somebody who's got a real fast car and having them like kind of, you know, pilot it around in ways that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. But, you know, it's good for me to kind of take that in because I, th I think in, and some writers don't suffer from this. I suffer from it. I can be too literal. So mm -hmm. I can think about a car chase in terms of positioning. This one is faster than this one. This one is closing the gap. Here are the things we have to navigate around. Here's the thing we got to jump, right? And it's all very literal, which would be fine if you were doing it as a film and you would just kind of pace it out and shoot it and then whatever. Yeah. But in a comic book, there's so many different ways to imply all of that stuff happening. You can do it with rear view mirror reflections. You can do it with the effect of the speed on people on the block, almost Looney Tune style, right? Yeah. Like they're all these different things and, and to, to sh kind of shatter the, the paradigm of why well, I literally need to see these six images in sequence because that's what happens. Yeah. And, and then move into, but I can do it like this. And then the reader can experience what's happening, even if they miss some of those geographical details. Yeah. You know, that that's something I'm, I'm starting to do now and starting to change and evolve like the way I would execute something like that. Yeah. You, this, this conversation brings to mind, um, I was really, really good friends with Mike Ringo, and he. Oh, okay, hated, wow, right on. Yeah, and um, we talked almost every week, and the phone bills were insane. But there's an extended period of time where he was working on a book at DC, and it had nothing but vehicular chase sequences, and he hated them because the sequences are written so literal and unimaginatively. The idea was the chase sequence itself was the exciting moment in a comic book, and I, I, I am sure that you're discovering through what you're doing um the the fact of a vehicular chase is not inherently exciting it's not and, like yeah, yeah yeah and uh he was always going well how the hell am i going to make this chase work and and we're talking about a guy who had a cartoony expressive style who can do who did kinetics pretty much as well as anyone in the industry ever has and he was stuck with these dead on the page scripts with, with, with the superhero character, you know, involved in, 
essentially car chases and motorcycle chases that he had to make work because there was nothing on the page helping him. It, you know, there's I like a, the fact that you're taking the extra step forward to say, I have to understand what this physically can transform. What, what, how can I take this and give the information to my artist to actually make the storytelling work better? Well, yeah, because I got to get out of the, the you know, because the when you write a screenplay, I just tell you what happens. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this happens yeah. when they turn the corner and then there's a, then there are two workmen that are carrying a big pane of glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One is really overweight and has a little uh, Hitler mustache. The other guy's skinny and has a funny hat. Right, and then one of them is smoking like a stubby cigar, and then they raise their fist when the glass shatters, and then the fruit cart, right? So yeah. My uh, cabbages! Yeah, oh, yeah, turbo revving young punks. So <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think get out of all of that and think about what's it feel like? You know, how can I translate the feeling of this? And, and there was a, a short sequence in Detective 980 something or other 984 or five i think where bruce is uh driving this ferrari and it's very much a rocky four homage yeah. uh so if people read it and call me out on that i know it's a rocky four homage thank you i did it on purpose but it's all about like the gear shift you know like the gear shift and the thing and the whatever and like the kind of the cutting of it and making that work i'm just really fascinated with the different ways we can make those evocative experiences. Uh, I, you know, I, I put up a question a little while ago about manga versus traditional comics. Yeah. And well, I got way more responses than I thought I was going to get. I mean, I got huge amount of, uh, and people were, people were really going in too. They weren't just being like, well, I like manga better. You know, it was like, well, for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, and matter of fact, and another yeah. thing, you know. A lot of little big fans. Like, yeah, don't underestimate you, you them. No, no. I mean, I never did. That's why I asked the question. But there's a lot of ingenuity, you know, that goes on in, in stuff. And because all the, the there's so many different genres, and each of the genres has its own expectations of crescendo and, and, and you know, kind of, you know, solemnity and whatever it is, uh, they're trying out so many different things all the time. And you can learn a lot about possibility from looking at manga. It's, well, that, I really can't get over anyone anyone thinking that you know there's an inherent bridge or wall that has to be transversed to actually incorporate hp are you okay yeah okay sounds like something took a tumble over there um, I, paper. I will happily reread you know blade of the immortal and say okay i love how we did this action sequence and then go you know a year later i go i i'm gonna take some of that what he did there and utilizing my stuff because it's going to go through the translation of me as an artist doing my own storytelling and the same thing if i'll go to like you know 1970s european comics stuff that would have originally appeared in heavy metal or metal right, right. um anyone who says that you know manga are not comics doesn't know what you're talking about it's all comics it's all comics. It doesn't matter what tradition it comes from. What it is, though, is like I can pilfer from Mobius. I can pilfer from, gosh, I, I, I don't want to keep picking on Blade of the Immortal. I'm looking over my manga shelf. I can't, manga. I can't read them. <laughs> I need my glasses. Um, uh, I can go back and I can, I can rip off Frank Miller ripping off manga in... Um, in uh, either Dark Knight or before that with uh, Ronin. Ronin, certainly in Ronin, yeah. And a, yeah, and a well, lot in Sin, Sin City is basically a manga. Like, exactly. Especially when, when Dark Horse put out the little digest versions of it, it just turned into a manga. You're like, oh, I didn't know this was a manga. It totally is. Yeah. Um, well, Frank Miller has essentially been in manga mode ever since uh, Ronin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Frank, Frank Miller is about his Japan, for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, it's it's... I, I I have been writing comics for a while, but I do not feel like I am at the level of like you and, and Clay and people who that really get the medium. But oh, what, you're you're good. Uh, well, thank you, <laughs> thank you, HP. But what what I try to do is I, I approach it the same way that I approach like music, you know, and it's it you can listen to something really radical, like let's say you put on like Rush or something, uh, so you get like a ten minute prog rock track. Okay. Yeah, there might be like four or five hit songs in that track, and you just sort of pluck out like, "Ooh, I like what they did there with the skip beat and the thing and the chord change." That might be a whole thing, and that's 
my experience with manga is I'll, I'll look at it and be like, okay, this is a lot of this. Um, but I really love what Satomo Nihei did right here. Yeah. Right. Like I, I, and that's excellent. And you can build an entire, if not a project an issue around this thing right here and, and, and making it work. Um, uh, so I'm huge into that. I saw someone mentioning on the chat here, Stallone's performance in the end of first blood. Yes. Sylvester Stallone's performance in first blood does not nearly get enough credit. It is actually acting because yeah. I think he is a good actor. First uh, blood is a, is a film. It's a story. Uh, it didn't turn into like the jingoistic stuff of first blood part two until later. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So first blood is a movie that I think people should revisit. Yeah. And see Copland, but if you're revisiting Stallone. Oh, Copland, yeah. man. Like, you know, being right isn't a bulletproof vest, Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Like, when I heard Mangold was doing the, the first Wolverine, I was really excited because I'm a yeah. huge fan of Copland. Yeah. And Same then I, yeah, I saw it and I was like, ah. But then, like, Logan, as soon as I, I saw, like, the first five minutes of Logan, I was like, yep, there's James Mangold. He's here now, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, no, First Blood is definitely underrated man it's yeah. it's uh you know it's one of those movies that that tackles like ptsd and i think in an interesting way yeah and if you read the david morell novel it makes a lot of changes from the novel the novel is also interesting but a very different experience um it was very much the, about america post vietnam it was it was like more especially like morell's thing you know troutman is more of a predatory character yeah. And it like the kind of the, the father figure aspects aren't really there. He really is a stand in for kind of, you know, um, uh, Big government. yeah, authoritarian, like abuse of yeah. soldiers. And Rambo is is pretty cray cray. And, and, and the like, sheriff is a lot more sympathetic. To, totally. Totally. Yeah. The sheriff yeah. Is, yeah. is a lot more sympathetic in there. Um, uh, it's it's interesting. So for those in the chat, yes, you should watch First Blood and then you should read the David Morrell novel because Morrell's an excellent writer. I don't know what he's working on since, but. It's a great book. Yeah. Oh, okay. HP, Richard, I have to get out of here. So do I. I, I had a tooth extracted first thing this morning. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you talking? You are a crazy person. I, I, I was, I've been on painkillers all day, and it's starting to wear off. I was, I was... Oh, that's, that is, that's awful stuff. Well, you, sir, should either get back on the painkillers or, you know, get a little Johnny Walker or something, swish it around. Um <laughs> I am going to eat a salad because I need to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> so I'm not eating bread for a while. Um, but uh, thank you, uh, uh, HP, for uh, having me on. Enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Thank you, Richard. Enjoyed yeah. that. Too. Great. Uh, Clay, you, thanks, HP. Wherever you are. And thanks for everyone uh, asking questions and listening. Yeah, and, for real. Uh, let's, let's, thank you guys for contributing like to the cast. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. Why don't we do um, it after your book launches? Your book's coming out in what? Um, November. November, right. just in time for Thanksgiving, because that's the best time to have a conversation about skinheads. <laughs> All right, so why don't we have a, a a book club when your first issue comes out, and we'll we'll tear it apart. Yeah, but, yeah, please. <laughs> you, you can you can target all of my nine panel grids. <laughs> I'll be like, you bastard, you're poor artist. <laughs> right, right on. All right. Well, thanks everyone in the chat. Thank you guys for having me, and I am gonna break out. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night. Everybody. Cheers. Okay, bye guys.